You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Welcome to Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. Each week, we'll take a deep dive into the world of volatility with in-depth analysis, trading activity reviews, strategy breakdowns, cutting-edge education, and much more. We'll also bring you exclusive conversations with the traders, researchers, and asset managers who are reshaping the volatility landscape. If it involves volatility, then you'll find it on Volatility Views. Volatility Views is brought to you by SIBO. When it comes to trading volatility, trust SIBO, the creator of the VIX Index, for in-depth and relevant information. SIBO's blog gives you up-to-date trade insights, analysis, and positions of VIX options and futures. No matter what kind of trader you are, there's plenty of useful information to take the guesswork out of creating your portfolio strategy and to help you make more educated moves in the market. Visit www.cboe.com slash blogs today to sign up for regular updates via email. And now, it's time to take a deep dive into the world of volatility. It's time for... Volatility Views. All right, everybody. That music means it's time once again for Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting, at least we hope so, Options Insider Radio Network. You guys know the drill. You're listening to us. So hopefully you've subscribed to us somewhere or you're probably streaming it from our site or one of our partner sites. And of course, if you are so inclined, you can always grab the full network, the whole kit and caboodle, wherever you find your favorite podcast program. Just search for our name, Options Insider, or just go the full the full way. Some of those searches, not that great. Good. You know that. Uh, Options Insider Radio Network. It's a long thing. You only got to type it once. And then you find our full network feed, and then you're off to the races. You get everything. Our daily news, our advisors option, our this week and futures options coming up after this show in a little bit. Uh, all sorts of fun stuff. Option block, ball views, all the good stuff that we do here on the old network. You don't have to lift a finger. You subscribe once. It's coming to you uh, aboard your favorite platform of choice. And, of course, you can always join us live every Friday, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern, via the old Mixlers, M-I-X-L-R. Follow us on social media or pay attention to our website, and we tweet out the link, put the link up there all the time. You can just grab it once, set it, and forget it. You never have to change it because it's always the same. And you can always you can also follow us on Mixler as well. I know a bunch of you have done that as well. So you notify the second we go live so you don't miss a bit. And a day like today, it's important. You may not miss something because some stuff is happening. And, of course, however you listen, live after the fact via the iTunes, via our own app, however you listen, uh, make sure you hit us up, questions, comments, insights, all sorts of fun stuff. We do love to hear from you guys at the end of the day. And a lot of stuff popping off today, so we need some people to join me. <laughs> let's start off. Let's go, uh, let's go down the street here. Let's go in order of proximity. Let's go down the street to the corner office over there at the CBOE where I'm joined by someday, hopefully, in the not-too-distant future by Dr. Vicks. Right now, we'll just call him Mr. Russell Rhodes from the Options Institute over there at the CBO. Mr. Rhodes, welcome back to the program on this very quiet, nothing to talk about day. Yeah, it's like a nothing to talk about week. I thought maybe we should just cancel the show. Now it's close. I was close to canceling oh, no. it, but I thought, you know, we already scheduled it and everyone's here, so we might as well might as well do it. You know, it's your typical August doldrums kind of show. Nothing really going on. Speaking of the doldrums, you think of nothing happening uh, in August. You think of the coast of Maine where people are just lazy and eating lobster and hanging out by their boats. And that's where we go now to where we are joined by the Rock Lobster, Mr. Andrew Giovinazzi. We tore him away from his lobster pots uh, just to join us today. It's such a boring day in the market. We wanted him to join us anyway. Mr. G, welcome back to the program, sir. Plenty of excitement here in Maine. Plenty of excitement. Plenty of excitement. 
Those even lobsters, they were they were almost jumping out of the traps. <laughs> there was so much excitement. Even the lobsters are excited in Maine. And I believe I believe we're headed back out to the other coast where we are joined by uh, he's been on before listeners, but now he's coming back on making his second appearance on the old program. He is Bill Valentine of the Commodore Fund. Mr. Bill, welcome back to the program. Refresh my memory. Where are you beaming him from, sir? Uh, that would be Bend, Oregon. Uh, West Coast, three hours from the water, uh, due east of the uh, the Oregon coast. Here with my mask and snorkel, ready to deep dive into the volatility with you, Mark. I like it. Three hours east of the water. That means you're pretty you're pretty far east. About as far in as it goes in Oregon, huh? And we're in the high desert. We're on the other side of the mountains. We actually live in a very dry, sunny place, unlike Portland and the coast. Wow. Well, you picked a good day to join us because there actually is a little bit of stuff popping off. So let's get to it right with our volatility review it's time to break down the latest developments in the volatility trading world it's time for the volatility review all right everybody time for the old vol review the portion of the show where we break down the week that was and indeed still is from a volatility trading and trending and all sorts of fire and fury perspectives. And oh, oh, what a week it has been. You know, usually you get to this time of year and quite frankly, we could usually run a bunch of best ofs because there's not really a heck of a lot popping off in the world of vol. But in the last few days, it's certainly, that narrative certainly has changed. How long have we been saying, listeners, on this show, how long have we been saying, oh, where is the vol? When can we get some vol? Oh, woe is us. No vol, no vol. But we were also saying, you know, looks like some of the options paper we were seeing out there was starting to maybe, I don't know if the warm had really turned per se, but it seemed like it was starting, more people were starting to position for something to retrace a bit. We started seeing the return of the old one by two. We saw that crazy, funky size, crazy size risk reversal. We saw this old school buying of upside calls like the SEP 20s and others. Started to see more of that piling in, which was of note and interesting. And it seems like some of that paper may indeed have been well-timed because, of course, later this week we saw uh, VIX finally breaking out of that single-digit range and getting up there. In fact, today, uh, spike, uh, spiking as high as 17 and a 28. That's a level we haven't seen in quite some time. Pack, pretty much back since right around election time, a little bit after the election last year. That's how far back you have to go to see another, you know, high teens VIX level. November 9th, to be precise. So a lot of stuff popping off. So, Bill, you picked a good day to join us. Since you're our guest, I'll give you pride of place. A lot to sink your teeth, in, teeth into this week. What really caught your eye from the just madness that was vol this week? God, you know, Mark, I've been trying to think about how to phrase this because I have so much I want to share. In fact, I, I just want to just take the next hour and not let anybody else talk and just go off. Oh, well, it's called the Bill <laughs> Valentine Show. How about that? <laughs> we could do that. Works Wouldn't be the me. first time. Let, let, let me tell you, let me just tell you this real quick. I, I think a couple of things are very, very interesting are, are going on. First of all, in terms of the volatility, re, volatility reaction of what happened yesterday, clearly uh, overshooting uh, both with VIX itself as well as everything in the, the VIX complex, the derivatives, options, futures, uh, and, and the swap side. Uh, this is the new normal. Makes complete sense to me. What it is not, however, and this is my evangelical message, and I'm out here saying this to people, and people are throwing rotten tomatoes at me. VIX and VOL, we do not have a short VOL crowded trade situation. That term is being thrown around way too loosely. It's not being backed by hard data. It's being put forth by people who will benefit personally in their life if, in fact, others will buy that argument and buy their services from them. So my point is that there's a massive amount of confusion and misunderstanding due partially to the, the complexity of what volatility is and also partially to messages being put forth by people who will benefit by, by convincing you to go long or long vol and long convexity. Uh-oh, a little tinfoil hat out there. I like it. A little zero hedge action coming in on here. Uh, agendas, conspiracies, and so on and so forth. I do like that. I think we'll get into that because I know that, that's a big talking point for you. I think we'll get into that in a little bit because there's a lot to sink our teeth into the kind of anti. Uh, you come on here with a lot of anti stuff. We talked VXX last time, anti VXX erosion. Now we're talking anti, anti short ball squeeze. I like it. I like it. But before we get to that, let me bring on the other 
cohorts to give their first impressions from this crazy week in the world of Vol. Uh, let's start with you, soon to be Dr. Vix. I'm sure uh, the phone's been ringing off the hook all week at SIBO. What the heck's going on? What's going on? How does this rank historically? All that fun stuff. Mr. Vix, I know you have all those data points. Uh, what say you, sir? I, I put my phone on do not disturb because it's because I'm supposedly on my sabbatical right now um, and and have been handing things off to the other instructors to deal with. You should have known this was coming while I was going to be trying to focus on how diversification doesn't work as a is a uh, dissertation topic. Uh, but to agree with Bill, I, I think he actually is going to find more agreement with respect to the the fallacy that short VIX is a a crowded trade. If short VIX were a crowded trade, uh, the VIX future, the August VIX futures would have gone up in line with spot VIX yesterday. And I think that not happening is a clear indication. Us going into backwardation is a clear indication that uh, relative to the potential liquidity that that mark that that pit downstairs can handle, uh, short VIX ain't is not ain't. I'm even going to use my southern word, ain't. A crowded trade. You've been out down in Oklahoma too long. Well, we got two votes for that. Let's get the Rock Lobster in, then we could we could debate that uh, that freely. Mr. Rock Lobster, a lot uh, a lot popping off this week. Uh, what caught your eye, and what caught the eye of your crazy chatters over there in the option pit in this just volatility free for all of a week? Well, it, it was a volatility free for all. You know what's funny is why. So my first question was. Because we've all been talking about this ain't no single digit VIX president, you know. <laughs> now, why why was it this set of chit chat um, that made it, you know that made Vol that made Vol move? So because it's I, double crazy. I, I guess it's crazy times two. <laughs> you know what? To also too. Yeah. You know, it's two crazy I'm, guys. And I'm not trying to be overly political here, but. All I could say is it's two guys with the worst haircuts on the planet are having an argument. That's right now what I'm saying. <laughs> that's what it, that's what it really so is. That's, the that's what it takes to drive the ball. Anyway, two fear. Anyway, so I noticed a couple things. One is I, uh, I, I agree with Russell because he is Dr. Vix. But, yeah, we got severe backwardation. Um, I don't think Vix Cash itself – Got, you know, I would say overpriced. I mean, the market moves 1.3%. That's a pretty good size move. Uh, no way if I'm a market maker, as I used to be, that I'm going to hold the line at a 6% at the money volatility when the market's moving, you know, almost 20%, you know, daily. So that's, so the cash part, I just think just sort of hung with, you know, uh, what the market was doing. Uh, Future wise, though, and that's what we had a, as a subject in our class yesterday. We you went deeply backward, like crazy. Um, VIX call flies, one of my favorite trades in backwardation. Um, you were picking those up for like a, a sing song, nothing. Um, so as a trade wise, uh, certainly there was opportunity yesterday, um, and today I think is kind of a strange day just because you've got the weekend. Nobody's quite sure what. You know, the Donald's going to say whatever the president's going to say. Um, and there's not a massive rush to sell vol into the weekend, although it's coming off because there is no more news. Um, you know, if there was probably more or different, uh, you would see VIX going higher. Um, but there isn't. It's just more of the same. And then generally everybody's kind of seen this movie now. But the, I guess the game's a little different. This is a little bit different of a game than we've had before. So I was trying to think historically to equate it to. I mean, you could roughly Cuban Missile Crisis, but probably not. Um, that was the last time we had this kind of brinksmanship. I, but this is kind of a different brinksmanship. Uh, and, you know, equity markets did not do well during that because nobody knows what the hell was going on. Um, so generally, geopolitical, I don't know stuff translates to markets with um and i think the biggest thing and maybe russell can talk about this is we had a lot of trade yesterday a lot of volume but you know what i was seeing in the in terms of how the futures were trading and how vix was trading was i i characterize that as just liquidity dries up at a level so you know you have market makers they're trading you know whatever and then all of a sudden liquidity just disappears and it goes up to a new level, right? So VIX goes from, you know, 11 to 13, boom, 
right? And that's the new level and everybody's trying it out. And then all of a sudden, like bing, 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 electronic trading, all the offers are getting lifted and all the liquidity providers go, boom, now we're going to trade 15, 16 vol and all the markets disappear. So I think um, the what's happened was, is this is certainly, uh, it was a reflection of nobody knew really what to do. So when they don't know what to do, and especially as an ex-market maker, what I used to do is go, oh, vol's 50, it's now 100. Let's see what they want to do. Um, oh, vol's 100, now it's 150. Let's see what they want to do. And if I keep writing red tickets up, I go, okay, now we're going to make it 200 and see what they want to do. And then I look at all my earlier tickets and I go, an option I sold for a dollar is now worth $8. And I go, okay, no nothing is working. So vol will keep going up until what? All of a sudden, a liquidity provider can buy some options back. That's the nature of how uh, vol trades, at least that's how I remember trading. Um, not much has changed, except it happens now much faster because um, you have a, a pretty robust electronic marketplace. So I would, again, and then the backwardation is still hanging in, although the backwardation is coming off. So that's a little bit of the, uh, you know, things are starting to reset, but... It is who wants to go short a lot of vol into the weekend. So overall, that would make the vol products hang a little bit because the futures aren't moving so much. Um, so anyway, that's what I think we have. Um, is it a, you know, is it a recipe to sell vol? I think there's plenty of opportunity to do it. It just doesn't feel like it's ready yet. I think now you'd have to definitely. It was a subject we had today a little bit in our chat room. Is to, to me, the trade is you can sell juice and spreads, but you have to buy the explosion and, you know, and try to and try to price that. Uh, we did a little bit, uh, as you know, in the chat room today. Um, lots of there's lots of opportunity out there when the vol's higher to kind of make those things uh, line those things up. So I think that's what we got. You know, and I was glued to my computer screens for the last three or four days, just just watching things move. So I. You know, will cooler heads prevail? One would hope. But I think the vol is going to come down a little bit slower than it went up. I think 9% volatility in the month of August. I think it's going to be tougher at this point. Not that it can't happen, but um, then I think the 9 VIX will be very, <laughs> it'll be very tough uh, to get down that low. So then, and I think that's where we are. Yeah, you know, it's funny. The, you know, you mentioned uh, the, the craziness. I used to find in those environments <laughs> that, uh, it would have kept getting crazy. Maybe sometimes a good trade, too, was just to, uh, to hit the little boy's room for a little while and see how that stuff. So you avoid having those, uh, those crazy tickets in your back pocket that you kind of regret later on that you ever, you ever sold that volatility level. That was always a good trade sometimes, too, in the, as Don would say, not to sell in those, in those environments. <laughs> <laughs> Born from hard-fought experience. But you're right, this was a crazy week. Speaking of some records, it uh, was records pretty much across the board. Yesterday, the most active uh, day ever. In VIX options, history will parse uh, that paper flow in a little bit, but about 2.5 million contracts. Yes, 2.5 million with an M there, listeners, going up yesterday. That beats the single previous day record of almost 2.4 million contracts. It's back in February 3rd of 2014 uh, adb also looking pretty strong out there as well vix futures also doing pretty well about 939,000 contracts going up on thursday uh, that beats that blows the doors off really a single day record previous to that which was 791,000 back on october of 2014 an interesting little uh, side note here the 10 busiest trading days of all time for the futures not for the options for the futures four of them have so far happened this year, which is uh, kind of interesting. So in this year, we've all been kind of anemic, and everyone's been saying, what the heck's been going on? We're setting records left and right for volume numbers, which is, uh, which is strange pretty much all the way uh, across the board. But let's, let's get back to what uh, Bill was talking about earlier, because I think there's, there's a lot to discuss there. Bill, this has kind of been the, the dogma in the vol space for some time. I think, in fact, I think it was the journal, maybe Bloomberg, I think it was the journal who coined this term, the volatility feedback loop, and people have kind of run with this ever since. It's really gotten out there, this notion that everyone kind of collectively awoke 
to the notion of selling vol after the election because we saw vol spike in the overnight and then pretty much immediately come back in the subsequent sessions. So if you were patient and held your short vol, even a few sessions, you ended up coming out all right. And the, the narrative, at least according to the people who coined this phrase, was that everyone at that moment, if it Brexit didn't do it, it was the election. They said, wait a minute, the long vol trade isn't really working. I need to get short vol. In fact, just a couple of days ago, there's another piece, I believe it was in Bloomberg, hyping, hyping this again, saying investors never been short more volatility futures uh, going on about how it's effectively a bit of like a gamma scalp trade. They're selling near term of uh, Vega, near term vol, near term gamma in order to finance their long term vol positions. So a lot of interesting stuff. But you're saying this is all hogwash. This is all conspiracy stuff that it's not really not really true. Huh? Let us in on your theorizing here. Yes, yeah, so it's total nonsense. And it's not necessarily conspiracy things. I think you, you have two people perpetuating this message. One is people that will directly benefit in their jobs if you think and I think that we need to get long ball and long convexity. There's three groups, newsletter writers, option overlay companies, and people that sell a long ball strategy. That's where 90% of this noise about the crowded, quote unquote, uh, short ball trade is. There is a difference between the popularity, the pedestrianization of owning VIX-related ETPs and being, quote unquote, net short vol. A crowded trade, a true crowded trade, and again, I've been around for 30 years, I remember what the term was originally intended to mean, was that there was a massive disproportion between short and long. In a true crowded trade, for example, you wouldn't have implied volatility as high above realized volatility. You understand? If people were truly pushing down volatility because there was so much selling, that gap would be narrow. That gap right now is pretty normal. It's within the normal range of what the you know, what we call a volatility risk premium. Second point, true short vol happens on the S&P side. This notion that the ETPs are all of a sudden indicative of shorting vol. There were short vol strategies long before there were VIX ETPs. I mean, condors, uh, flies, selling set to straddles, selling strangles. That's true short vol. And that's where the vast majority of the volume in short vol is. What people are confusing is their shoeshine boy now owns XIV, and that seems like a short vol indication that's happening across the world. This is a small pocket of the overall vol complex. And if you look at the ETPs, and I'm staring at the number right now, take a guess. Somebody, somebody throw out what the assets under management are currently in vol ETPs. Anybody want to guess what that number is? Assets okay. under management. It's up around three billion. Or many, so, many billions, but I, maybe I was going to say, I was gonna say six. If you take and you include something like UVXY and TVX, TVIX as sort of like double because it's notional double, it's five billion right now in uh, VIX ETPs. Ooh, I was close. Woohoo! And then if Long you say ago. what is the spread, what's the difference between the long exposure and the short exposure? Seventy-one percent of it's long, thirty percent of it's short. Okay, so if you sum up. XIV, SVXY, ZIV, so on and so forth. That's only 30% of the assets in our management. Now, some people will come back and say, yeah, but they're shorting a whole bunch of VXX. Would you believe that there's twice as many dollars short XIV than VXX? No, of course you wouldn't, because the world is short ball. BS, it's all nonsense. All nonsense. Well, it's interesting. You know, we have seen, you know, the, the way ball has played out over, let's say, the last three to five months it certainly has uh, reinforced some of that. You know, in fact, we were just joking on the show. I think it was I think it was Russell said a few weeks ago that, you know, the, the spikes are so short lived that the short vol trade is you can't even wait days or weeks to short the spikes. You have to do it in hours, if not minutes. Uh, so there was an aggressive, uh, a very aggressive uh, trend out there in the marketplace, call it what you will, to really, as soon as there's any spike, just harvest the heck out of it <laughs> to get it back down to uh, somewhere in those uh, near single-digit levels out there from a, a VIX cash perspective. And there's certainly, it worked pretty much uh, until this week. <laughs> and who knows, we'll see how long this spike lasts. So so are you saying all those people who are coming in and to use the the term aggressively harvesting the risk premium, all those people we're not part of this this volatility feedback loop, this this massively crowded short VIX trade. That was something else? No, 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 absolutely not. It's, it's, so there's a tremendous amount of liquidity, a tremendous amount of interest in futures and, and options on VIX, thanks to the good folks at the CBOE. It's a very, very popular series of derivatives, as it should be. And it provides tremendous liquidity. This is a very, very wonderful thing. And it moves super fast. 
What we saw yesterday on the, the VIX complex side, in my opinion, was the natural reaction of the net commercial traders who are net long the same dollar that the non-commercial traders are net short those futures, oh, by the way, and they're delta hedged and they're responding the way that you do when it moves against you. So um, th the thing is, is that part of the problem is when, when people are trying to make the argument that there's a crowded trade and they're showing uh, information related to anything having to do with VIX and they're not scaling it for the, the log normal change that's happened in the volume of trades, in the, in the, in the price change in, in the instruments themselves. For example, one of the charts that, that's been out there, which is, which is just not right in my opinion, is this notion that uh, traders have never been more quote unquote net short VIX futures. Okay, number one, there's no such thing as net short. What you're saying actually is that non-commercial traders, people that aren't delta hedging for a living are net short. That is true in a contract basis. But VIX is also was, as of a couple of days ago, was at 10. So if you adjust it by dollars, then it becomes not true. The fact that it looks really good on a bar chart has everything to do with the fact that VIX used to be worth a lot more than it is now. So if you if you take that net commercial not, uh, position as a percent of the total volume, you're actually no more short today than you were in 2013, than you were in 2012, and you're certainly a lot net longer than you were in, in 2008. So my point is, is that some of this stuff needs to be scaled differently if you're going to put the chart out. It's, a, it's, a, it's an eye-popping chart to show a bar that says, holy cow, look at all those contracts that people are quote-unquote net short. Like, dude, there's somebody on the other side of that trade who's delta hedged, who's keeping liquidity in the market, who's allowing it to flow uh, orderly. So yes, there's a tremendous amount of short vol interest, but there's also a tremendous amount of net long vol interest. It's a it's a zero sum game. I just, I just, I don't, I don't understand why people can't get some of this stuff. <laughs> the old zero sum game. A lot to unpack there. You're right. It is an attractive chart. Uh, a lot of our listeners like it. Our, our chat seems to like it too. Clinton Burnell in the chat says he's rolling on the floor laughing. I don't know if that means he's he's buying your theory. Uh, Bill, or perhaps he's laughing at the theory. I don't know, but he's he's enjoying it at least. He's laughing, so that's a that's apparently uh, a good thing. Mr. Rhodes, you've heard this. We've discussed this before on the show. The notion that there is this feedback loop that short vol, short vix is a very crowded trade. Uh, Bill's here debunking, doing his doing his vol mythbusters thing again. It's kind of like his shtick now. Uh, what do you what do you have to say to this? Uh, are you taking the other side? Are you saying uh, there still is that feedback loop out there that it is crowded and that Bill's just a crazy man in a tinfoil hat? Oh, Bill, <laughs> longtime listener and dittos. I just totally agree with everything he was saying. Uh, the one, the one uh, thing I'd like, I just wanted to add a little bit to it. Back at RMC in the spring, uh, I forgot what presentation it was. It was probably one of the first day ones. It's a little bit more educational. And we did have a discussion about this very topic. Uh, and and I, I cannot remember who uh, answered this question, but they, the, the response, or the, the question basically was, uh, relative to what is out there right now, uh, how much more do these things need to grow as far as the different VIX derivatives uh, before you think there might be some sort of uh, liquidity issue or that the that they might start to influence the futures market. And somebody from research said three to four times. Uh, and, and yesterday we did three to four times uh, what our average, we did between three and four times what our average volume is. Uh, I think things went fairly orderly. We did hit price points and kind of, kind of, take the stairs up. We kept working our way through different levels. It's not like we saw some nasty spike and everybody got out of the way. Uh, they, they played nice and then they stepped back for a minute, played nice and stepped back. So, uh, you know, I, I think yesterday just really, uh, you know, other than being just a great day all around for this place, um, it, it, it proved that uh, you know, the, the pit that we have down there is able to handle uh, just about anything that's been thrown at it so far. That's true. I mean, that, that is a crazy amount of volume. I'm trying to think. I'm kind of hard pressed to think of some other pits, you know, outside of maybe the S or let's say, you know, Euro dollars over and crazy. Some of the other crazy ones that do crazy numbers and many other pits or products in general that could that could you know, logistically put up two and a half million contracts. If you go up to your random equity right now and say, I'm going to print two and a half million contracts out there, you blow people's minds. They would have no, no way to process that, let alone enough uh, market makers or traders to do it. So 
that is indeed a, a tip of the hat to the robustness of, uh, of the VIX product as a whole. Uh, Mr. Oh, oh, before we toss to the Rock Lobster, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dr. Vicks, you got more on this? I could tell it's itching at you, this tinfoil hat debunking. Well, one other thing with respect to the big volume yesterday, you know, a week or two ago, we had one block trade that, that was three different legs that was about 1.1 million contracts. Yesterday was basically uh, a lot of different trades. It wasn't, you know, we did 2.5 million contracts. Very often when we have those big volume days, you attribute them to, uh, you know, one or two maybe very large yeah, block trades. One whale this coming in and moving consistent, everything. consistent trades all over the place all day long. You know, that, that is good because you're right. That's a good point to point out it's just because, you know, how many times have we said whenever it, it kind of shoots past one million? How many times last year was that one, those one million contract days are one by two friend rolling, you know, and that was pretty much one trade with about three legs or six legs accounting for 800, 900,000 sometimes of that, of those one million contract days. So, yeah, it, it is sometimes the, the one lone whale who can move the needle. Yesterday it was a few whales and a bunch of people's grandmas and everyone else. Uh, piling in, and of course, all piling in net short ball just to uh, just to get Bill's uh, Bill's gander up. But there, uh, Mister Rock Lobster, you've been uncharacteristically silent, letting it all come and wash over you. What say you, sir, to this uh, this debunking of the crowded short ball trade? Um, <laughs> it it never seems to. Uh, well, first off, about the volume and the o. Remember the OEX, the juju in that pick goes back to pre eighty seven. So. If there's ever a, a spot on the SIBO floor that could, that is was set up to handle massive amounts of customer paper, um, it was that one. Uh, so that is a, it is a, it is a hopping. Uh, if anybody's been on the SIBO floor, just the way that pit's set up, it's set up to do the mass volume. Um, two is I had some customers start to complain about certain firms were upping their margin requirements for all of the vol products, options for the vol products. Um, you know, at VIX at nine there, everybody was kind of tightening the noose a little bit, so to speak. So it, demanding a little more margin. Um, those are kind of the, the standard, uh, you know, over the counter wirehouse uh, type brokerages. So that was one thing. Um, it makes it a little more expensive for everybody to trade the products. So then there's, there's that. Um, as as far as the crowded trade, it always has sounded great, but you know ultimately, you know there's, you know futures are futures, just like Bill was saying. I mean, um, I think the the problem in general is, and I is, um, you really saw the VIX swing because uh, I, I like what Bill was saying with that about. VIX moved fast because people were covering that stuff fast, and the vol was moving fast. Um, and that was the fastest, um, and, and that's the stuff that takes the brunt the quickest um, and where the market makers just have to just move that stuff really, you know, as, as fast as they possibly can. So as far as the, the crowded trade, the zero hedge stuff and all that, it it always sounds great, but the reality, too, is, even, no matter who you are, if you're short, what if you're short, have been writing the futures down, and there's been, and we've mentioned this before, there's been healthy future premium, um, not abnormally high, but still kind of historic norms, you know, sort of along the curve. You, you know, you're still VIX is nine, and you're going to cover that crap. I mean, how, <laughs> okay, it works, it works, it works, and then when it doesn't work, if you're smart, you just close it. Um, because you keep you you've had such a good run of it, you don't want to have this one day totally hose you, right? So you're like, screw it, I'm out, and I'll go back to doing it again once it once everything calms down. So I think that's also a it's a reaction of people that want to take you know small losses and not big ones. When VIX only on Tuesday, I think that traded a year low uh, intraday, if I'm not mistaken, but had to be darn close. And literally, that was what that was nine sixty something. And we traded 17 yesterday, so they were smart to close. Um, and the last thing I'd say is, as long as we're in backwardation, I was I was telling our, our roomies yesterday, worry when you have – VIX was trading, what, 16 and a half or almost 17 bucks, and the August 30 future was 13 – it might have been 13.40 or 13.50. We were looking for opportunities. It was like $3 underwater, Right. 
I go, the day you worry is when that future is trading 20. <laughs> then you can start crapping your pants because right. there's no, because all of a sudden then the future traders are throwing up their hands and saying, whoa, something that we don't get this at all, right? It's just that you did not get that pricing. Um, and that's what I said. That's when you start to build, you know, trades on the opportunity the futures are giving you at the time. So, you know, the, the biggest hint, and, you know, of course, I'll be dropping my Easy VIX uh, webinar at the end of this show coming up. But, you know, the key to trading VIX is you got to learn how to trade the futures. And if yesterday was ever a clinic and really what what the uh, what was going on in the the heads of the liquidity providers in the futures, you know, you look at the curve and you see what VIX is doing and you start to do a little, you know, uh, mental gymnastic interpolation magic and figure out, you know, the kind of positions that you want to have. It's like I told uh, my the guys in my class, I go, you're a market maker, okay? I'm stuffing your butt in the VIX future pit, okay? <laughs> the broker comes in, make me a market in the August 30s, right? And you got to do it. And you say, I'll sell them at 1370, right? And VIX is trading 17. I go, why the hell would you sell something at 1370 if the underlying's trading 17? You got to have an opinion, right? Everybody's like, oh, they think vol's coming down. I go, exactly. So there's a reason why stuff is priced the way it's priced. And uh, Russell made a great comment about that. And the day you go hide under your desk is when you see VIX trading 17 on a pop like this, but the one month future is trading 20. Go find a spot under your desk and just wait till it all clears out because it's going to be a not very good day. Not a good day at all. Apparently, you got some fans out there, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Rock Lobster. Uh, there are Clinton in the chat room saying he wasn't laughing at, uh, at Bill's tinfoil hat conspiracy. No, he was actually laughing at one of your jokes earlier. So apparently uh, you have a, you have a fan. Did you invite your mom to the chat room today, Andrew? I don't know. Yeah, I just uh, invited all my other chat room guys in just oh, to go. just make me look. There good. we go. So he's uh, you got one person who likes your no accounting for taste out there apparently. Oh, getting back to your point, you were saying before there, uh, Russell, about a lot of volume going up in the VIX. Not just volume from a couple of giant whales, but a lot of trades. Actually, I think it's uh, Sahib. I believe he's over at Reuters. Uh, he's listening. He says about twenty-seven thousand trades in the VIX options. Kurt quoting our other friend there, the flow master, Mr. Henry Schwartz over there at Trade Alert. That's versus about 3.1 thousand trades back on the 21st of July. That's, of course, the day of the big, you know, half. Of, I think it was actually a million contract VIX spread. So a little bit of a uh, little bit of a point counterpoint there, a comparison for your sake out there, listeners. So a whale day versus a everyone coming to play, maybe a guppy day. So there you go, Mr. Rhodes, uh, some data backing up your your synopsis there. Great minds. <laughs> great minds. All right. Speaking of, <laughs> speaking of Mr. Rhodes and great minds, we've been talking a lot. we got to get rolling with the show. We can probably talk short, vol, crowded uh, stuff for quite a while, but we've got to get rolling. I know Russell's chomping at the bit because this is one of the few days of the year where he's just got, he's got an embarrassment of riches to choose from. Usually he's hunting and pecking through the scraps. Today he's got just fillets and, and T-bones flying at him left and right. He can pick from delicious picking. So without further ado, let's get right into Russell's Weekly Rundown. Now, Russell's Weekly Rundown. All right, sir, I won't hold you back any further. Have at it. The floor is yours. <clears throat> Not a whole lot of trades to pick from. <laughs> You know, honestly, because next week is standard expiration, uh, there wasn't as much as I was hoping for. But there's a lot to talk about. Uh, a couple of good trades on Monday. Uh, somebody bought the August 30th 13 calls for 89 cents and sold the August 30th 18 calls for 33 cents. Uh, got a, That cost a net of 56 cents. I believe they're doing better on that trade at this moment. And then also somebody uh, di kind of in the same uh, same thinking, I guess, here. Somebody bought uh, 1,000 of the August 30th, uh, 15 calls for 52 cents, and sold 1,000 of the August 30th, 20 calls for 22 cents, and paid 30 cents for that. So a couple of uh, long volatility trades, uh, and I had to double check them to make sure they weren't short. Because usually when you hear something like a 13, 18 call spread or 15, 20 call spread, 
uh, in this day and age, they've been selling it, but they bought it. And they weren't buying it when, when we were starting to have our volatility event. In fact, they weren't even buying it when we had heard the term fire and fury. Uh, any long volatility trade from Tuesday on is going to be a fire and fury trade. Uh, didn't see any good weekly trades on Tuesday. Wednesday, uh, somebody sold or no, somebody bought. This is a bad trade. Somebody bought um, 3,000 plus of the August 23rd 12 puts, not looking very good right now, for 80 cents and sold uh, an equal number of the August 23rd 10 and a half puts for 15 cents, uh, paid 65 cents, looking for VIX under 11.35. That, that trade Boy, worked pretty much every week except this week. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's unfortunate. Um, and I, I, if you're listening, sorry. Uh, somebody also on Wednesday before all heck broke, lo broke loose uh, sold the August 23rd 12 calls for $1.47 and bought the 13 and a half calls that expire on the same day for a dollar, uh, taking in 47 cents. They've got a break even of 12.47 on this. I mean, that's not unheard of uh, still. I, you know, it's not, not quite panic time yet. They've got uh, a week and a half left. And based on, History, I wouldn't be overly uh, overly worried about that. Um, now, Wednesday, I had nothing. Or, I'm sorry, Tuesday, I had nothing. Wednesday, I had some. Thursday, I had, it's like you said, man, give me the George Costanza nickname of T-Bone because I can pick off all, I, it's, it's all kinds of things that I could pick from. Uh, somebody bought, and there were a lot of, of fading the moves with, with spreads more than anything else on Thursday. Uh, somebody bought uh, the 12 puts that expire on August 30th for 76 cents. This was early in the day and sold the August 30th 11 puts. They sold twice as many of the August 30th 11 puts as they purchased of the 12 puts paid a dime and they basically have a profit zone of 1190 down to uh 1010 I believe. Uh they there was another trade just straight up uh selling the August 16th 12 and a half puts for 58 cents and then buying the August 23rd 12 puts for 68 cents paying a dime. Uh, they're hoping that if, if they're if they're looking to the following week, they're hoping ball holds up till the middle of next week and then falls off a cliff again into August 23rd expiration. Uh, one of the bigger trades I came across and, and kind of interesting, uh, actually buying into potentially higher volatility. Uh, they bought the August 16th, again, the standard expiration, 14 calls for a buck 39 and sold the September 13th, which is a weekly expiration, sold the 19 calls for $1.09. Uh, they paid 30 cents for this trade. Uh, they're good on the August 16th expiration if we're above 1430. And then, you know, they're basically short the September 13th, 19 calls. So uh, I thought that was kind of an interesting trade and an interesting way to get short term long vol exposure. And uh, then hope that that you know World War III doesn't kick off. Uh, somebody did yesterday, late in the day, uh, buy the August 30th 18 calls and sell the August 30th 22 calls. Uh, that ended up costing them 34 cents. And I wonder if that's a cover. I just I, I can't really tell, but I wondered if that was a cover. Uh, somebody sold two. This was about an hour ago yesterday. Two of the August 23rd 11 and a half puts for 45 cents each and bought one of the August 23rd 12 and a half puts for 95 cents. The net cost here is a is a nickel and a break even between 1245 and 1155 uh, at August 23rd expiration. And then one more trade I thought was was kind of kind of interesting, I guess. Uh, somebody bought two of the August 23rd 21 calls for 50 cents each and sold one of the September 13th 19 calls for a dollar two. They took in a two cent credit. And if we get a huge volatility exposure and go into some cool backwardation, uh, this trade might work very, very well. So I had a lot to choose from. Uh, didn't uh, and, and really just didn't didn't go find anything 
of interest today. But there, and we're, it's already 1245, man. Crazy. Usually I'm not talking about these things this late in the, in the broadcast. <laughs> that shows how much, how much there is to sink our teeth into this week here on the old show. Yeah, it has been an interesting week, like you said, today even, and it would be you know, a near-record day and most other days. 1.6 million contracts already going up here by a little bit through halfway, a little past halfway through the session, and probably a lot more coming on the tape. Uh, as we head forward, yesterday, about as you said, a record day, 2.38 million contracts. Uh, Wednesday, also lighten it up, 1.8 million contracts. Tuesday, about 928,000. Monday, the comparative laggard, only 573,000 out there. Call the put, lighten it up a little bit. That's 3.4 to 1. Not surprised we rally a little bit. Some people maybe taking some of those calls off the table. Uh, we also saw some action in the puts yesterday. We can get to that in a little bit. Uh, ADV right now hovering a little bit north of 700,000, about 706,000 uh, to be precise. In terms of the hot Vic strikes, the number one hot action positions out there in the mothership, big options, VIX options, I should say, for uh, this week. Number one with a bullet, still the OC 25s, 601,000. You'll be called, listen, that was part of that big a whale trade, that risk reversal a few weeks ago where he blasted out, I think, 500,000 of those versus that uh, risk reversal. Uh, SEP 20 is number two, 575,000. Number three, uh, the AUG 20s, 415,000. So that 20 strike, surprise, surprise, all of a sudden coming into vogue. Number four, uh, the AUG 30s, 378,000. So 30, maybe also that's coming back to the fore as well uh number five the comparatively reasonable in fact in the money oc 15s with about three hundred sixty-five thousand open there number six the first and i believe uh, the only put on the list the uh, oc excuse me oc 12 puts three hundred fifty-two thousand. that also was part of that crazy funky risk reversal that went up a few weeks ago uh number seven aug 35s three hundred twenty thousand. number eight the aug 17s 293 Number nine, the AUG 21s with about 260,000 and rounding off the list, top 10, the number 10 spot, AUG 15s with 250,000 contracts. Total of nearly just a tick under 14 million contracts, about 10.1 on the calls and about 3 point, excuse me, 10.8 on the calls and about three, almost 3.2, 3.1 million on the puts. Uh, speaking of interesting options activity out there in Vixland, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dr. Vix one day, uh, we talked a little bit yesterday on the option block. I think it was your, your cohort there, Rock Lobster, the meatball, who pointed out that in a day like yesterday where Vix is exploding and everyone and their mother is scrambling to get long, one of, if not the largest trades in Vix options yesterday was massive buyer of the AUG 11 puts. Uh, I think it was for 35 cents. So uh, that one perhaps not looking too good in hindsight. That gets back to what you were kind of alluding to before for Russell about people piling into uh, the weekly puts as well. For all of this year, pretty much, that trade has worked. And then this week, finally, maybe the one time where the, re the, the reversion to the downside wasn't kicking in. So kind of a bit ironic there, Mr. Mr. Dr. Vix, that in a, a record day for Vix and pretty much every level spike into the upside, that uh, the big trade is still buying puts. People still fading it. Maybe that goes back to Bill's short vol conspiracy trade there. Conspiracy? I think we no. I think we. I, I just. I think we've debunked the uh, conspiracy at this point. At this point, I just want to give Bill more chances to talk short box. I know. I know he loves it, but we do have to keep rolling. It has been uh, super active out there. I don't think we even have time really to get to uh, earnings of all Nvidia, Snap, and a few others. Disney popping off this week. Maybe we'll get to those at another point. Uh, just not enough on the old docket. Uh, to, to not enough time on the old docket to share with all of that stuff. But we got to keep on rolling. Let's go uh, really quickly, a really quick volatility voicemail. It's time to share your thoughts and opinions with your fellow volatility traders. It's time to check the volatility voicemail. Make your voice heard by dialing 779-669-4VOL, posting a comment on the optionsinsider.com, sending an email to questions at the optionsinsider.com, right. or posting your questions to twitter.com slash options, or facebook.com slash the options insider. All right, everybody, welcome to the Vol Voicemail. Like the man said, the portion of the show where you guys ask questions. Sometimes we ask you guys questions. I thought it'd be uh, apropos to ask you guys this week in light of what happened yesterday. What are you feeling? What are you feeling with this big move? Well, when we wrote this up yesterday, the VIX had spiked to 16.17, and we know now it hit 
over 17, 17 and a quarter about. Uh, so what do you guys think? Temporary blip or is this the end of low volatility? What do you think we will hit first? Will we break 21st? So get into the serious quote unquote vol range or we get back down to single digits below 10 or are you feeling, you know, the hell with it? I'm just going to cash. Uh, Mr. Rock Lobster, we'll start with you. What do you think our audience is feeling? Granted, today's today's move may have colored things somewhat, but uh, what, do you, what do you think our audience... Well, what is your pick, and then what do you think our audience is picking? Um, I think the audience is going to... To be honest, I think the audience is going to say, we're going to stay away. We're going to stay away for a little while. Uh, me, I'm one of those, I will stay away today, and I will deal with what I see on Monday. There you go. <laughs> there you go uh, how about you mr bill what is your vote and what do you think our audience is picking they're hitting 20 first hitting 10 first or they're going to cash well i think it's a it's an unfortunate conundrum to actually be long convexity and long ball and hoping for nuclear war that creates a moral quandary right i mean because that, that is a bit what's of a happened weird in the last two days has been entirely this this saber rattling and i think really what's happening and i've seen this a lot in 30 years is that the market sometimes just needs a good cry and we've had a nice orderly ascension for the last how many months now? And sometimes we just need an excuse to blow off a little of that steam. I think we got that. So absent nuclear war over the weekend or something that moves us closer, I think we absolutely, you'll see the short ball guys come in and, and fade this son of a gun down to, you know, 10, 11 uh, at this point uh, sometime next week. Interesting. So you're 10, 11. So you're saying you're voting for single digits then, I'm guessing. Uh, shy of 10 into the nines, perhaps. Uh, that's that's what our poll is asking. It's a very binary poll this week. And Mr. Uh, Dr. Vicks, take it home. You think our, while you vote in north of 20, are you voting single digits? What do you think our audience is voting? Uh, I think we see above 20. Uh, this, the, something's, you know, it, we, we've got a few more of minefields as the year goes along. And it's been a while. We're kind of overdue for a, uh, crooked number a crooked two to start vix so and and then uh, andrew made a good good argument earlier that getting back to nine is going to be pretty difficult at this point yeah yeah given this uh given the, the current term structure perhaps that is a, a challenging feat and a lot of our audience almost half agreeing saying 49 percent saying they're looking for some serious vol ahead aka vix to hit 20 before it hits the single digits, 30%, though, saying they're thinking think single digits again, and about 21% so far saying, yeah, heck with this, I'm out, I'm going to cash, this is too rich for my blood. So we got a lot of really in-depth mail here, unfortunately don't have time for that. Let's do, um, let's see, <laughs> a friend, F. Contango Trader, he, he, must, he must be a fan of the meatballs or perhaps is mocking him, because every week when Bix moves, he, he sends this to us saying, how many percent... Of did Vix went up today, and he puts hashtag percent of percent, so he knows he knows that's the meatball's biggest pet peeve, the percent of percent. Maybe he's maybe he agrees with them, maybe he's mocking him. I don't know. Either way, he sends that to us pretty much every week when Vix uh, moves aggressively. He sends in that pretty much that exact uh, same tweet. Mister Rock Lobster, you we got a follow up question here from Jack. This is about what we were talking about uh, a week or two ago on the show. We had the listener write in about. Um, about uh, market maker who asked about XIV, what are some of the dangers there? I think Jax is following up saying, "What does today's VIX move mean for XIV? Will this blow them out?" I think they got scared by our talk last time. Well, XIV still printing listeners, trading about seventy-seven thirty-three right now. What do you say, Mister Rocklaps? Are you concerned? Is this is this the end of the road for XIV here? <laughs> Well, it's not the end of the road for XIV, but you noticed um, it kind of had a rough day yesterday. And it's even with VIX down, the cash down 127. Um, this is something I, I'm trying to remember. Maybe Russell knows, but the la I have a hard time remembering the last time UVXY, VXX, and XIV were all down <laughs> uh, on a day. Oh, it it happens. Every once in a while. But, <laughs> well, it's it's usually if there's a lot of volatility around the the close, and the close is at, you know outside of what the NAV is. Okay. And okay. and that does and and especially in the ETN world that that happens periodically. So, uh, it's been a while, but it has happened before. Right. I figured it was some sort of internal machinations with managing the products. It's, it's interesting the uh, the academic world really tries to latch onto that one and, and, and explain how such an arbitrage can happen. Uh, and I have to explain to them, it's not really an arbit, you know, it's, uh, it, it's just, you know, a hundred lot going up at the end of the day. 
<laughs> no, no, really, at the last price or whatever. But, but and typically, if you take a look at what happens in the aftermarket on days um, where where the next day everything's looks a little wacky, uh, there was pro they were probably getting back in line between three and three hundred one pretty quickly. Right, because I remember like UVXY was flying um, after the market hours, um, so it was in like what forty four bucks or something like that. So it's coming, it's relative comeback down to earth. Uh, yeah. Mode. So yeah, but I but that's what we talked about today. Vol products probably they're probably stuck at least for today, and then we'll resume some sort of some sort of activity with the futures on Monday, and mm -hmm. we will see what that is. Speaking of what we will see, we will keep on rolling to see what we see for the future when it comes to VIX. It's time for the crystal ball. It's time to peer into the future and reveal what the volatility gods hold in store. It's time to look into the crystal ball. All right, everybody, welcome to the Crystal Ball, the portion of the show where we embarrass ourselves week after week. <laughs> we managed to do that last week. Pretty big swing and a miss for all of us. It was looking good. I was looking really good until about a day and a half ago. <laughs> My 9.75 or so was really spot on until it wasn't. Uh, yeah, all of us uh, aggressively fade in the vol. Uh, Mr. Rock Lobster, actually, ironically, uh, being the most aggressive to the upside, swapping places with Russell. Usually Russell's the one out there picking 15 or 16, and he would have looked very prescient this week, but he picked that week to fade it, which we said, I think we actually joked on that show, maybe that was the moment when the VIX was going to break, and of course it did. So there you go. Russell, you are indeed the indicator, or the contrary indicator, perhaps, that you always wanted to be. So that, with that said, since none of us won last week, <laughs> actually, we have a guest. Let's let him go first. Bill, uh, what are you feeling for this time next week, VIX Cash at the close of our show, sir? Absent nuclear war over the weekend, and I've got my fingers crossed that we don't have nuclear war over the weekend. I'm guessing 10.50 this time next week. I, th I think war implies there could be an exchange. I think even if, even let's say North Korea could do it, they could launch maybe a, a one lot or a three lot, you know, somewhere in the radius of Guam. I don't think they could, re they could keep it up. I don't think there's going to be a war. I think it'd be like a one off and then, uh, then we get down to business. But uh, that said, 10 and a half, huh? So absent nuclear war, we have a, we have a vote for 10 and a half. Interesting stuff. Uh, let's go, Mr. Rock Lobster, because you were. Uh, "Quote unquote closest." If if five handles off could be considered closest, uh, what what are you what are you feeling for next week, sir? You know, you're qualifying my win, which I feel is is discriminatory to the people <laughs> of Maine. When it's, when it's off more than three handles, it, it's only a win in quotes. Listen, it was higher than you two nabobs. That's all I have to say. So to, I'm I'm Mark in my column, in my notes. That's a win for me. That's a that's a W I. If that's what you need to go to to get your head down the pillow at night, then I will allow it, sir. <laughs> uh, where are we next week? My my little my nose just falling. The future says probably probably lower, um, but I think we might go higher at least once. Uh, but probably twelve ish, something like that. It takes a little bit to get to ten, but I'll say like twelve oh one. There's my number for next week. 12.01 for the Rock Lobster. Someday, Dr. Vix, what are you feeling, sir? Well, first off, I just want Andrew to know that every time Mark doesn't win, he discounts the other people's win. No, I, I've, given people, I, I've given people props. Get awesome. used to that. I, gave, I, think Ophir, to that. I think Ophir got it within like a hundredth of a point once. He was pretty much a bullseye, so I, I gave him his props when he got it. I give people you, their props. You, he, you, you brought up time traveling and cheating at that time. Just, I remember that. Just because no one can dethrone <laughs> me from my, from my crystal ball championship throne doesn't mean you have to be bitter about it. I, I, um, I'm, th I'm thinking we remain up around 13 and a half or so. I don't think this thing's going to go away. I'm rooting for nuclear war. <laughs> You're going for it. There. You're like Guam versus <laughs> Guam versus North Korea, round one. That's what Russell is uh, Russell's looking forward to. Well, uh, let's see. There's a lot, a lot of pickings here this week. We got a whole range uh, to look at. But I was like in the 12 handle till Mr. Rock Lobster got in there as well. So I'm gonna go a little bit north. I wasn't gonna go that low anyway. I'm gonna say about 12. Let's go 12 double. 12.55. That feels good to me. A little bit less but not quite a single-digit realm because, hey, there's fire and there's fury out there. So how can you get single digits when there's both fire and fury? If you had one, then perhaps I could see it. But both, then you got problems. Speaking of problems, we got problems because the show is over. <laughs> we want to keep going. We want to keep talking involved, but we're done. 
Unfortunately, that's all we got for the show. But before we go, let me bring it back around the horn one last time to get to our friends here. Tell us what's cooking off with them. Let's start with our, our guest, Mr. Bill of the Valentine, excuse me, of the Commodore Fund. Mr. Bill, what's cooking in the Commodore Fund? And people like what you were saying here. They want to get more mixed myth, easy for me to say, Vix myth busting. Uh, where should they go? What should they do? <laughs> ValentineVentures.com or uh, follow me on Twitter at, at BeValentineCFA. Uh, real quick, I, I just want to make two things real clear and then I'll shut up. One is that I am agnostic to the direction of volatility. I am short ball, but I also have a long ball fund. So this isn't just pumping up uh, the short ball message. Second thing is, if you are short ball, it's super easy to hedge it. Don't be naked short ball. Mark, thanks for your time this week. Good to talk to you, uh, Russell and Andrew. I like it. Valentine Ventures. So can I come to you if I want to finance my new chain of like hot dog stands? Can I do that too? Are you that kind uh, of venture? Give it a, as far as you know, yes. <laughs> well, there we go. So you got a hot dog stand or you want to talk Vix myth busting, hit them up over there at Valentine Ventures. And one day in the distant future, Dr. Vix, what's cooking in the realm of all things SIBO aside from setting records every day? Uh, hopefully we're going to keep setting records. We're, we're all about Bitcoin, man. That's my, uh, that's my weekend reading. I'm going to be getting up to speed because sooner rather than later, I think you're going to be able to trade Bitcoin futures at the CBOE futures exchange. You're not the only one of my hosts who's doing deep research into Bitcoin. Everyone's hitting us up Bitcoin these days. So apparently there'll be a big talking point going future, going future, going forward. It'll be nice to hopefully have a nice listed product we can actually all trade and talk about and see and have clearing and all the other fun stuff. So hopefully uh, SIBO will pave the way and some others will follow suit and we'll get a nice, robust market. We'll have a new, a whole new asset class to talk about volatility here on the show. I'm looking forward to it. And last but not least, Mr. Rocklops, you mentioned your, I think you called it Easy VIX webinar. So this is, if I can just put some words in your mouth then, this is your webinar, How to Make a Million Dollars Tomorrow Trading VIX with No Skill and No Risk. Is that the name of your actual name of your webinar? Uh, you, you, we could, I could paraphrase, you know, what, what is that? A subtitle to the title? Could we do that? Can we subtitle it to the it's title? Your, it's your webinar, uh, however you want to call it. <laughs> well, you're always so good with naming stuff. So, um, also not bad with logos if you haven't. Yes. Yeah, so this is what it's going to be. It's going to be a webinar and I'm going to teach you stuff. You don't know about the VIX for free for 30 minutes. And then you have to pay $19 to learn more for the next hour the following week so you're going to get those dates soon so if you look at vix and you get host hopelessly slapped in the face all the time um we will teach you how to not get slapped in the face that's what i will guarantee you will not you will not be slapped in the face like you were rude to some girl at the high school dance <laughs> there, there you go there you go kids get the first taste for free the first one's free then you got to pay for the good stuff check them out over there optionpit.com to learn more. And if you like all the stuff we're talking today, talking index, vol, and volatility and skew, well, stay tuned. In less than a half an hour, about 25 minutes, we'll be coming back with Twifo. We'll be beaming some guys in actually live from the S&P pit over there at the CME to see what they, they've been putting up over the last day or so. Should be pretty crazy. We'll talk all things index, vol, and skew, as well as all of our other good stuff, crude and gold, and a bunch of your questions, too. So stay tuned for that in about 25 minutes. Twifo coming at you live. If you're listening in the chat, if you're listening after the fact podcast, you can get it wherever you get the rest of our shows. Meanwhile, We'll see you next week for more Volatility Views. Volatility Views is brought to you by SIBO. When it comes to trading volatility, trust SIBO, the creator of the VIX Index for in-depth and relevant information. SIBO's blog gives you up-to-date trade insights, analysis, and positions of VIX options and futures. No matter what kind of trader you are, there's plenty of useful information to take the guesswork out of creating your portfolio strategy and to help you make more educated moves in the market. Visit www.cboe.com slash blogs today to sign up for regular updates via email. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the 
Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.